This is Lisa from Mobile Tech Review, and this is the Gigabyte Aero 15. Why is that exciting? Because this is one of the first thin and light gaming laptops with the new NVIDIA RTX 20 series card. So this is available with your choice of an NVIDIA RTX 2070 Max-Q or 2080 Max-Q. It's too thin to have the non-Max-Q version. Max-Q version being, you know, the drill from the last generation models. The one that uses less power doesn't get quite as hot, quite as loud, that sort of thing. Otherwise, we still have Intel 8th generation 6-core CPUs inside, but now we have a Core i7 and a Core i9 overclockable option inside. We're going to look at it now. So, for those of you who follow Gigabyte, you'll recognize that this is the same chassis as they used last year, and that's not really a bad thing because a lot of people like that chassis, including me. It's very thin. It's 18.9 millimeters. It's very light. 4.4 pounds, which is 2 kilograms, and it's kind of classy and understated looking. And you've got a lot of ports here, much more than on your usual thin and light, even gaming laptop, including some unusual things. We have actual gigabit ethernet on board. That's nice. Thunderbolt 3, we kind of expect to see that now. Three USB-A ports, so plugging peripherals in is not going to be a problem. And they're kind of signature fast UHS two SD card slots. So content creators love that because, well, fast SD card access means faster import times. You get the idea. So beyond that, there are two display options. I think they noticed that everybody liked that LG Full HD panel that was available last year. So now they're saying if you go with the Full HD matte IPS display, it will be an LG panel. And it's 144 hertz, so it's fast refresh. Always nice because today's laptops are powerful enough to actually play well above the usual 60 hertz or 60 frames per second playability. Now they have x ray Pantone sticker on there, and they say that each one is factory calibrated. Well, not the one that we got. We'll talk about it that more in the display section. But there's also a 4K UHD wide gamut option, and that one's an AU Optronics display, and AU Optronics does make the lion's share of the 4K 15-inch wide gamut panels now. That one is also matte and non-touch. <laughs> now they're doing something kind of weird here, and Gigabyte software is not their strong point. If you watched my review of last year's model, quirky drivers, things like that. Well, so they're handing off some of their workload perhaps to Microsoft and Microsoft Azure, which is a cloud services kind of thing that your normal everyday consumer really doesn't think about or have any involvement with. But one of the things that Azure does is AI stuff. So the idea is here you have to give it a little consent. And then there's a couple of different modes you can choose from in this AI software as to how the laptop is going to perform. You want all-out gaming performance. You want kind of middle of the road. So it's sort of an AI-based power plan. And it's not really very effective so far. It does, you know, it might make a three frames per second difference in your game, which is not a game-changing kind of thing at all. So... There's that. Marketing. Yeah. When it comes to the software and drivers on this, they are getting better, thank goodness, because I really love the last-gen Arrow. I always wanted to buy one. I love those two M.2 SSD slots, so it's more expandable than average, two RAM slots inside, easy to open up and get inside, unlike some of the Asus Thin and Light gaming laptop models. But the drivers in the software, particularly with every update of NVIDIA graphics, it seemed the thing just got blue screeny and crashy and all that sort of thing. This has been more stable. And I had to get one blue screen, and it had to do with NVIDIA drivers, even though we're using it with the stock drivers that it shipped with, which are the most current. But things are getting better there, and their software is much more mature looking now, much more modern. It used to look kind of cartoony and old fashioned. So you can see on screen that. The, the settings, the control of everything looks very nice. And I like the way they have this quick list that you can see if you have the latest version of the various drivers that are available. I wish more manufacturers would make something that clear to the end user. Battery life is another thing that was really, sometimes really great about the last gen Aero. It has a 94 watt hour battery. That is absolutely huge in a chassis this slim and light. Now the Dell XPS 15 has even a slightly larger battery, but that is also a laptop with a much less powerful GPU, so we expect longer battery life there. But <laughs> the fact that this has NVIDIA Optimus switchable graphics means that if you're doing everyday productivity work or streaming your video, right, you, you expect longer battery life. It's going to use Intel integrated UHD 630 graphics most of the time. The last gen model was kind of unpredictable. I don't know what it was doing in power plants. So sometimes it seemed like it kept the NVIDIA card engaged all the time when it should have, and battery life could be three hours or it could have been six and a half hours. It was all over the place. So far with this one, and we will keep testing it, and I will 
update you all on social media if I see anything change. It is much more consistent. It behaves properly. Maybe that Microsoft or Azure AI is doing its part, right? So typically when I'm off the charger, I'm getting like six, six and a half hours of battery use with the display set at 150 nits, which is around between 40 and 50% brightness. So that's pretty respectable for a laptop that's powerful comes with the usual 230 watt power brick. Now the interesting thing is even if you go with a Core i9 and an RTX 2080, you're still going to get that 230 watt power brick. So I'm a, kind of wondering about the power constraints for those more powerful configurations, but I can't say because we don't have the more powerful model in line. Other niceties include a perky RGB backlit keyboard and it's a little, the software is a little confusing and there are a couple of presets, you have your Overwatch preset, your first person shooter thing, which does highlight individual keys in different colors. If you go to roll your own, I found a little bit opaque as to how you would set each key a different color, but it can do that at any rate. There's good news and bad news with the keyboard. Just like last year, I really like the tactile feel of the keyboard. It has good travel. It has good dampening, a nice spring return of the key, so it feels very crisp. But the one thing is be careful what you ask for for those of you who want a number pad. That means that the main section of the keyboard is shifted very far off to the side and feels a little cramped, a little netbook-like. And the trackpad is fairly far offset too, and it's certainly not going to be centered under the space bar. So it's something that you have to get used to. If it's your, going to be your main laptop, it's probably fine. You will get used to it, unless you have really big hands, that is. Uh, but if you switch from a work computer to this one to another computer, then it may be a little uh, every time you start using it. But other than that, it really is nice to type on. And they have N key rollover for gaming, all that sort of thing. You can press more keys than you have fingers, and supposedly it will keep track. And as a Microsoft Precision Trackpad, it's a pretty good size. It behaves very well. It's good stuff there. Happy to see that, because some gaming laptops still have dicey trackpad. So how about performance and how about cooling, right? We're putting a, a next generation GPU in here, right? We're keeping the CPUs the same, but as we know from all of the last generation thin and light gaming laptops, they're hot monsters, you know. And this one, they are certainly using BIOS to limit the CPU and the GPU. So that means that when you're gaming, you'll see core temperatures hit 90, 92, sometimes 93 at most, and there will be thermal throttling. Given how thin and light this is, that probably isn't a bad idea, much as you folks who want to squeeze everything out of your laptop might not be too happy about this. So I can understand why they did that. So now we're not seeing hit 100 degrees centigrade stay there, which is the maximum allowable before the CPU might hurt itself. For the NVIDIA RTX card, we have the RTX 2070 Max-Q version. There's also a 2080 option too. And we have the Core i7 8750HK. We don't have the Core i9 option. So potentially you could have even more heat involved and more throttling. But for the card, it looks very promising. Besides the fact that it does ray tracing, which not a lot of games support yet, and we haven't really seen the fruits of that in deep learning for performance, that sort of stuff, it is a faster card. But if you're playing games at 1080p, then you're gaining maybe 10% of performance, which is nice, but it's not earth shattering. We just can't expect NVIDIA to do amazing things with every generation. Usually every couple of generations, they have a huge performance leap. So there's that. And then there's the fact that the Max-Q versions, really, their base clock speeds are significantly lower than the desktops. And last year with the GTX series, the desktops and the laptops are almost the same base clock speeds. So you might be clocked at 1500 megahertz for your base clock speed on a desktop version of a RTX 1070. But for the Max-Q model here, the base clock is often as low as like 735 megahertz. Now Gigabyte does a little better than that. We're in the mid 800s for that clock speed. So you're not going to see comparable performance to the desktop cards in this generation, not from Max-Q anyway. When we review some of the, the full-on non-Max-Q versions, I expect to see somewhat better performance. Even that said, again, you've got about 10%. And particularly, it's going to be more noticeable, the performance improvement with DirectX 12 titles, because that's where the RTX cards really start to shine. And obviously, if you care about ray tracing when it is available in more games, then yeah. Given the Max-Q version of this, um, you know, this is not so much of a 4K gaming laptop. If you get that 4K display, it's probably still going to want to play at 1080p if you're expecting 60 frames per second or above. But that 4K display there, I think, is for people who buy this to do content creation, and that makes a lot of sense. More pixels, more gamut. Now, how about for physical casing temperatures? For those of you who are not into the whole core temperature thing so much, 
Do you remember the MSI GS60 Ghost Pro? I had one of those several years ago, and it was one hot customer. It was one of the first very thin and light, powerful 15-inch gaming laptops. This one certainly carries on that kind of tradition. It gets very hot on the bottom when you're gaming. I'm talking about 61 degrees centigrade, which is 142 degrees Fahrenheit. I like my tea at about 142 degrees Fahrenheit, not my laptop. So there's lots of grill going on on the bottom, and the hottest spot is in the center where there's a lot of open grill. Two wise things Sensei will tell you here. Number one, do not put this directly on your legs. You will hurt yourself, literally, if you are gaming. Number two, don't do that because you're going to block the vents and the thing will run even hotter. So put it on a laptop cooler, a laptop platform, a magazine, whatever you have. Uh, when you're talking about the keys up top, it's above human body temperature too. It's over 100 degrees Fahrenheit. We're 98.6, us humans. So it's not as hot near the top. Most of the heat is going to be at the bottom. Now, if you're using this for productivity work, for streaming video, it'll get warm, you know, again, just a few degrees above human body temperature, but not hot. It's going to, you'll notice it's warm, but you won't go, ooh, ow, ooh, ow, or oh, it's making me sweat. So have no fears if you're going to be using this for productivity. When it comes to fan noise, these are very high quality fans. They did a good job with that. If you're gaming, you certainly will hear them, but they're not grating. They're not annoying. They're just moving a lot of air. If you're doing productivity work or streaming video, the fans will be spinning very slowly. You actually won't hear them. You'll probably think that they're not even on. So now for a little more detail about the display. We have, again, the full HD one. We don't have the 4K one. It is an LG display, as they promised, and they promised that you'll be getting an LG display, too. I, this Pantone certification thing, you know, it's interesting. They, in their software, they have a control panel there, and you can actually choose different color temperature profiles and stuff like that. Uh, ours is most certainly not particularly factory calibrated. It has good brightness. It has the expected good gamut. Uh, but the color temperature is way off from what I selected. When I selected the ideal 6,500 Kelvin, it measured around 7,700. The, the gamma on this is way too low. The contrast is not great because the black levels are kind of high. So I noticed when I was playing things like Shadow of the Tomb Raider, some of those interior cave scenes, they're kind of dark and lacking in contrast already. And I felt a little bit hobbled by the 640 to 1 contrast ratio. Here's hoping the 4K panel is better for that. I mean, it's not a terrible panel. It's very pleasing looking if you're playing a brighter game like, say, Far Cry 5, where most of the time you're running around in beautiful blue skies, Montana, then it's good. In terms of sound, you'll probably want to use your headphones if you're gaming. The built-in speakers are not bad. They're two-watt speakers, and you've got two of those for stereo sound. And just like MSI, now they're using the Hemic 3 audio software, which I have nothing against. It adds some 3D sound effects and stuff like that. I, the, the volume is pretty much average for a 15-inch laptop, and the bass is not terribly strong, but for a thin and light 15-inch laptop, that's not unusual either. Headphone audio is quite nice on this, though. So to open this up, Torx T5 screws. Now be mindful that there is a little black sticker on these three screws. You have to poke through the sticker and unscrew them. There's no anti-tamper language or anything on the laptop. I think they just want to know if you have been inside. So then you pry it off with a guitar pick or something similar. I use the iFixit tool, but guitar picks work as well to work your way around. Pop off cover, and here's what's inside. So here's our heat sink with... Two heat pipes shared between them. So they've beefed up the heat sink a little bit now. We're covering more of the video RAM for the GPU. The VRMs are covered. So that's, that's good. It's a minor change relative to what they had before. Two RAM modules, as you can see here, we have DDR4, 2666 megahertz, a Samsung RAM. They're big on pointing out that they're using Samsung branded RAM. If you get the 16 gig configuration, it's single channel because there's only one RAM module. I would still prefer that though because that way if you want to upgrade to 32 gigs later, you can just pop in another 16 gig module. And then you have your dual channel and you won't have to throw anything away. And in theory, you could go up to 64 gigs with the new 32 gig DIMMs that are available. This is an Intel M2 NVMe SSD. So that's a pretty high-end fast SSD and they've got a little bit of heat material on top to help keep that cool. In fact, it does run just fine. And here is our second M.2 NVMe slot. So you can put two SSDs in here. Nice, fast storage, right? And lastly, there's our killer 1550i Wi-Fi card, which is actually made by Intel. It's the Intel 9560AC card for the hardware. So for those of you who hate killer but like Intel, there you go. Not such bad news after all. And obviously our two speakers flanking right there, down firing. 
the two fans exhaust from the back. And yes, there is a little crevice here. It's kind of hidden behind a display hinge like Apple does with the MacBook Pro model, but it seems to get the air out fairly effectively. So that's the Gigabyte Aero 15 with NVIDIA RTX graphics since I refreshed at the very end of January 2019. And just like last year, I really like this chassis a lot. It's very mature, very clean. Uh, you might call it a little plain, depending on your taste. Some people like the more bling kind of look, but the ports on here, the Ethernet, the Thunderbolt 3 with full four lanes, the fast SD card slot, let's check a lot of boxes. A decent enough full HD display with fast refresh and a 4K UHD option. That's nice, perky RGB lighting. You get the idea, there's a lot of nice things here. The software certainly has improved since last year, but some things like that Microsoft Azure AI thing seem more like a gimmick to me. And I think they're doing themselves a disservice by distracting you from the things that are good about this laptop. I'm Lisa from Mobile Tech Review. Be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel for more cool tech videos, including a whole lot more NVIDIA RTX coverage. And thumbs up if you like this vid.